I love that music by my friend Wes Cunningham. I adore it. Uh, thank you, Wes, for making it for me. Welcome to season two, episode nine of my podcast, Mixtape with Scott. Before I introduce our guest today, I'd like to begin, of course, with these now very familiar words to you by Sue Johnson from her great book, Hold Me Tight, Seven Conversations for a Lifetime of Love, that describe perfectly the worldview and ethos uh, of my podcast and of me. We use stories to make sense of our lives. We use stories as models to guide us in the future. We shape stories. They shape us back. My podcast is about personal stories. Usually it's the personal stories of economists, though every now and then, and today is one of those now and then days, I'll have non-economists come on the podcast and tell me their stories too. But I agree with Dr. Johnson. <clears throat> I've thought this my whole life. Even when I was going back to being a little kid in Mississippi, when I would go to the movies by myself and feel that dark, dark darkness descend on top of me as the, as, as the holiness of a movie theater kind of rattles into being and I watch a new story sort of come before me. Stories have always been uh, an important part of my life. And as I've aged, listening to other people's story has become not only an act of love and respect to them, an honor to get to just be in their presence as they share who they are and share their story and where they got to where they are, but it's also the work that we do. I really believe that. I really believe it. It's the work that we do to make sense of a life that for many of us does not make sense. So I ask you today to come with open minds and open hearts and listen to Dr. Elizabeth Stewart, biostatistician who got her PhD in stats at Harvard University during an extremely productive time in the 90s for causal inference. She was a student of Don Rubin's. Um, I hope that as you listen to Elizabeth share her journeys as a young college student through her first post-graduation jobs to Harvard and then to Johns Hopkins, though even if it may feel very alien and very dissimilar to your own life, if you listen close, it isn't. So thank you for coming back again and again to my podcast. I am your host, Scott Cunningham. Okay, well, this is a real pleasure to have someone that I, I know uh, by reputation and from interacting on social media, but have never had a chance to actually uh, me talk to her at length for it. This is uh, Dr. Elizabeth Stewart, Stewart from Johns Hopkins. Thank you for being on the, um, the, the podcast today, Elizabeth. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It'll be fun. Um, so for the sake of the listener, can you tell us your name and your title and, you know, what you do for a living? Yeah, that, that might take a little while, but so I'm Elizabeth Stewart. Uh, I, my title is, let's see, uh, Bloomberg professor of American health, um, at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg school of public health. And I have, my primary appointment is in the department of mental health. I have joint appointments in biostatistics and in health policy and management. And I also serve as executive vice dean for academic affairs for the School of Public Health. So uh, kind of a whole mouthful, but that's it. Mm, okay, great. So where are you from? Before we get into your your uh, your later life, uh, your your career, can you tell me where, where are you from and where you grew up? Yeah, I grew up in a sort of, I guess, a small city, about 15,000 people in the middle of New Hampshire. So um, sort of a town called Laconia, New Hampshire, if anyone knows motorcycles our town is famous both for lake winnipesaukee and then also it has the second largest motorcycle rally in the u.s at weir's beach so mm. um a great spot a uh, nice again sort of had a small town feel um but and a beautiful location so it was a great place to grow up okay okay and so what were you like as a kid what do you enjoy doing like back in middle school like maybe fifth grade or, or maybe you know sixth or seventh grade what did, what were your interests uh, perhaps not surprisingly to this that I'm doing this now, I, you know, did pretty well in school. I always liked my math classes. I did some math tutoring on the side. I also, I was just kind of one of those, like, kind of did it all. I don't know. Looking back, I, I must have been really busy. In fact, I, I have a 14 year old now and I was telling her about the activities I did in middle and high school. <laughs> she was like, how did you do all that? All right. So I was on the field hockey team and I um, did the math club and uh, there was like a service club that I was involved in. Mm. Um, 
math team, I guess it was, we were the state champion math team actually, and the state champion field hockey team oh, wow. uh, in high school. So that was fun to do both of those things. Um, I was sort of involved in student government, like class treasurer. Um, mm. So yeah, just kind of a whole mix of things. Yeah. So what, what, what did your parents do for a living? Yeah. So this is actually really interesting. I think seeing where I am now. So I, sort of, again, to, to summarize, I am currently like a a statistician who does kind of statistical methods for mental health. Mm. My parents, um, so my dad was a minister, actually, a, a United Church of Christ minister who then had to leave ministry because of voice problems. Mm. And he became a counselor. So he became sort of a guidance counselor. And he, um, he worked actually at a... Um, he couldn't, he couldn't get the projection of his yeah, voice. Yeah, he actually had the sermons. same... It's the same voice problem that Diane Rehm has. Uh, it's called spastic dys dysphonia. So yeah, ah. sort of talking in public became difficult. He could, they, they, was, what about microphones? The microphones weren't, that. it was just not enough? Yeah, and I think just the uh, like the number of hours required that to be talking, uh, I guess maybe oh, in his counseling role, he was then more in a listening oh, right, <laughs> role. Oh, right, right, right. So sort of just the, the stress on his vocal cords. Yeah. Um, and so he worked um, part of the time, he kind of did a whole bunch of these sort of counseling jobs in our town. And one of the things he did was worked at a group home that the town had had, uh, again, this little bit of an aside, but it, it's you, it's interesting for me because now I do so much work in mental health. Mm -hmm. Our town had had one of the sort of state psychiatric hospitals that had yeah. closed right. during the deinstitutionalization. Mm -hmm. So now we had all these um, individuals in town with serious mental illness, and he worked at some of the group homes for them and would yeah. stay overnight there. And we would go and join them for dinner. And it was um, really great to get that sort of experience looking yeah. back. My mom had been a math teacher and then became a school librarian. So she was very involved in education and she was actually always worked at the schools where I yeah. <laughs> was a student. Yeah. Um, so it's just interesting to me because they sort of brought both the math side and this sort of mental health side, uh, which so it turns out. I've you were done. always, you were always interested in mental health. You, or it was. No, something? no, I wasn't. But you, oh, but so, but your but it became a part of your family just because your father sort of sorted into that job after his second career. Yeah, he was always interested in sort of helping others. Our family had a big spirit of sort of service mm. and community building and just helping the community. Um, and so that sort of ethos was very much a part of my family growing up. Um, mm. And then, but now, you know, we could talk more about this later. I never would have thought that I would do work in mental health. Um, right. and, but, you know, 20 years later, it's like, oh, actually... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of right. all came full circle. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because when you were interested in mathematics, you, I mean, I'm just imagining as a kid, I, I don't think high school when, you know, I think we're probably similar age because I was looking at your class of 90, was it class of 97 or 99 or something for, for Smith? Yeah, college was 97 to so high school. 97, 90, okay. So I, I, I graduated high school in 94. When did you graduate yeah. high school? Around that time? Yeah, yep. it doesn't seem like the math classes back then would it, that I, I don't remember social science and math, like even being something the faculty thought about. Oh, no, I didn't actually discover that whole world until after college. We can talk more about that. So growing up, yeah, I mean, I lived in a town where most, you know, it's sort of like, oh, if you were smart, you might become a lawyer or a doctor. Right. Um you know, and it just, the whole world of what I do now was like not <laughs> on mm -hmm. my radar screen. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. I mean, it's hard to kind of know, like, I mean, since I'm not really like a, a, a pedagogical, you know, ec I'm not an expert on adolescent pedagogy or whatever. It's like, well, maybe the, maybe you're supposed to just teach uh, the disciplines, you know, as independent of its applications. And there's like a good reason for it, but it's like, you know, there's a lot of people that are interested in people, you mm -hmm. know, and mm -hmm. society. And, and so they don't know that the math and the statistics will be really useful for that. And then there's a lot of people that have aptitude for math and, but, you know, maybe, I don't know. It's just, it's just seems like there's a lot of, there's a lot of education decisions that kids make and parents make early, early that you know they they make because of the limited information they have you know and yes. so i just i just i just sometimes wonder like is this necessarily is you know is, is there a way to get 
if you wanted people to know, if you wanted more sorting into math, social science, for lack of a better word, just like call it the the marriage of math and and studying people, you know, is 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 the way we're doing it now the best the the optimal way to do it at the earliest stage. Yeah, I don't know. It's a great question. And I, I do think, I mean, for me, the tension I feel in that is I think my career has been greatly helped by getting a really solid math yeah. underpinning. So like, I was a math major in college and I think that was really important, but at the same time, it did take me a little while to sort of find what I really felt like was the right fit. Right. I will say one kind of um, potential good path in this direction is there is now an AP statistics class for high yeah. school. Um, I'm hoping my daughter takes it. Um, and she's in computer science now. And so I think that there are sort of more opportunities along these lines. There's also AP, you know, economics. And um, mm -hmm. so maybe, you know, at least little snippets here and there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does seem like the AP, it does seem like the whole AP part of high school education is the, is where you do some of this. It seems like that's where you do some of it. I think uh, so. Well, so you in so what were your dreams back when you were uh, a high school kid? You know, doing doing well in field hockey and math. What what did you what did you dream of being one day? You know, it's a good question. I don't know that I had a specific vision. Although my jumping ahead a little bit to college, my college friends sort of would make fun of me because from like day one of college, I was like, "This is going to sound cheesy, but like I want to save the world through math," uh -huh. <laughs> and. Um, so I kind of knew I wanted to like, keep on the math side of things, but I also knew that I wanted to be doing something sort of social good oriented. Mm. And I just really didn't know how to do that. Um, so I kind of continued on the math path, uh, sort of in the meantime, you know, took some classes like sociology or history of science, some economics in college. Um, but I really was, you know, as a math major, chemistry minor, uh, cause I enjoyed those classes too. So yeah. it was partly just taking the classes I enjoyed. So I, I, so again, sort of, I, I knew I wanted to work in this general area, but I had no idea how to make that a specific <laughs> right. job. Right. Right. So you get to Smith of all the schools you could have gone to for with a, with this strong interest in math. It's like, I could have imagined you at MIT or something. You, you go to a liberal arts college. So can you tell me about why you, why you chose Smith? I mean, it's a, you know, obviously it's like a phenomenal college, but I'm just curious about you had to have had a lot of lot. You could have, I'm sure you could have imagined lots of different ways to go forward. And you chose that one. Yeah. It's, you know, I think looking back, I, you know, I was coming out of a high school with like 120 kids. I was honestly somewhat intimidated by like, I didn't even apply. I only applied to sort of small liberal arts colleges. I didn't uh, apply to Harvard. I didn't apply to MIT. I didn't even apply to Dartmouth, which mm. was sort of the default for someone Growing up in New Hampshire, who was smart, everyone was like, oh, why don't you go to Dartmouth? Right. Um, but I just, I was honestly intimidated by those environments and I wasn't convinced I would succeed. And I wanted a nurturing environment that felt like it would be really supportive and, mm. and push me in different ways. Um, so yeah, you know, I looked at Haverford and Smith and Grinnell and kind of a bunch of the, you know, really solid liberal arts colleges. Um, and then at Smith, well, the two reasons I ended up choosing Smith, the three reasons. One is my grandmother actually had gone there. And so there was a family, oh. you know, just sort of that. And I, she was a wonderful person. And so just that family connection. Second was um, in high school, I had taken a chemistry. I took chemistry in high school and had this like wonderful female teacher. She was amazing. But the boys in the class dominated. Like I was in a little group with some friends and the boys, I mean, and they're great people, but just, I remember, remember sitting in chemistry and thinking, you know, I want to be in an environment as I was trying to decide where to go to college. Like I want to be in an environment where the women are like driving everything and not having to sort of have people, other men around kind of uh, yeah. talking over us. Uh -huh. And then third, I got into a research program at Smith. They have a program called stride where I, um, got into this. And so from day one of college, uh, was hooked up with a math professor and work, started working on research from the beginning. And mm -hmm. looking back, that was a really foundational experience. Um, mm -hmm. and sort of that was really, so those sort of pieces are what really pushed it towards Smith in the end. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what, what were some of the, um, you know, uh, how, how what was your social life in college? Uh, what, what kind of friendships and things did you enjoy doing? 
Yeah. Oh, that's, that's a good question. Um, so Smith has a very strong house system. So you enter most people, and this is changing a little bit, you sort of enter and you stay in the same house for all four years. So mm. you um, tend to develop really close relationships with the people in your house. Um, mm. I was in the quad, which was one of the more social parts of campus. Uh, so it was a lot of fun. We had about um, maybe 30 of us who were first years, we're called first years, not freshmen. Um, together in that house. And we just developed a really close and most of us stayed in that house for all four years. I did go away my junior year to Oxford for a year. So I sort of left the house for a year, mm. but um, really that house and sort of those 30, 20 ish, 30 women um, became really my core social group. We had parties on the weekends. It's a fun environment um, being close to Amherst and UMass. And, but, you know, not surprisingly, I was also very tied to my home or, you know, not tied to my homework, but, you know, doing well in classes and, and yeah. keeping that. I did, I played ultimate Frisbee a little bit, took some fun, like yoga and tennis and um, mm -hmm. tried to do some of that too. Awesome. Awesome. So, so you don't mention stats at all uh, so far in this part of your life. You've not, you've, you've mentioned math and then chemistry. So you're like, it sounds like you're, you're kind of doing physical sciences, you're doing mathematics, but but when do you start hearing about statistics or being or being curious about it? Uh, that was after college, actually. So okay. there was one statistics class taught out of the math department. I will say um, Smith now has a really amazing statistics and data science program. They have mm -hmm. a whole department and major that didn't exist when I was there. So the math department was awesome and and very applied. So I did some like differential equations modeling. Um, I was doing some applied projects, but it was more in the sort of applied math rather than statistics per se. Mm -hmm. um, and so I literally, I guess when I was at Oxford, I took a probability class, um, but I really hardly knew about statistics um, throughout college. Um, I will also, I guess, sort of back to the high school transition, I entered college again, sort of in a it was this world where like, if you're smart, maybe you become a doctor. So I entered college sort of thinking I would do pre-med. Um, and that's partly why I was taking like chemistry. I also just didn't enjoy, like, I didn't like writing essays. So I didn't take any Smith at the time. You didn't have to take distribution requirements. So I didn't take any English classes, okay. um, but I took sociology and some other that, that and again, history of science and things. But um, so I kind of entered thinking I might be pre-med, which was also why I kind of skewed towards chemistry and stuff. I pretty quickly realized that medical school was not going to be a good choice for me. It turns out I faint when people are in pain in front of me. Mm, so that really not, does happen pretty regularly. If you were to have that, that was, that actually happened. It actually, or if people talk about like, if you uh, started relaying a story about breaking your leg or something, I would have to be careful <laughs> not to faint. Yeah. So I realized what, that? what happens. It's like, uh, that happened to me when we were, when my wife was giving birth. And um, uh, I mean, this is like an extreme example, but the, uh, she had to have a C-section and I peeked over and uh, uh, it was like this, this incredible amount of color of just, like, there was nothing gross at all. And I, I, yeah, fainted. I fainted. It was, it was unreal. I was like, the most unusual sensation it was not enjoyable at all no but it wasn't nausea either but it was definitely it was not a, a experience i enjoyed so that's something that you that is that kind of like what you experienced yeah i just get very lightheaded all of a sudden and sort of like uh. mm. so i've sort of learned how to manage it and remove myself from situations but again that kind of made me realize med school probably not a good choice um and it's in, funny looking that some people it's so funny from an evolution perspective that that trait would get selected on by some people, but not everybody. Cause I guess like some people yeah. just, they don't, they don't get phased at all. Yeah. I mean, partly I will say that this is like a little bit, maybe TMI, but I have very low blood pressure in general. And so kind of any little oh, kind of shift just it. like so, makes so my people blood might, pressure. So people might actually, it might be, everybody feels that, but depending on where your threshold is, it, it could. It impacts it your like it blood pressure more or less. Got yeah. it. Oh, is that what it is? Is it blood pressure? Is that what all I that stuff is? There's also, there's this vasovagal connection between like the brain and the body. I, 
I've never really looked into oh, it. Oh god! One of the listeners will actually know more. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> leave, leave a leave a comment if you know why <laughs> me and Elizabeth faint when we see blood and stuff. <laughs> it's like they go because it's gross. Yeah, because <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> That's why. Exactly. <laughs> we were we we evolved to get away from that stuff. All right. So uh, so you're so okay. You're 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 sorting out of the physical sciences. You, that that's that's what you're basically saying. It's like the yeah. the of being a doctor. Or something yeah like so then so i sort of was like a math major i want to also give a plug for the smith math department because um you know now people are like liz you're a statistician but you can actually communicate and talk and write the smith math department was very like focused on that so um at the extreme for example we had these um for any instructors out there some of our tests like in our main like calculus classes um were group tests where you a piece of it was individual, a piece of it was group, and a piece of it was the whole class. So like mm -hmm. I couldn't get a hundred percent unless I got everyone else to understand the concepts. Or I'm not just me getting them, but like sort of it was like a if the whole class doesn't understand something, no one is going to get a hundred percent. Um, with with this, so there was a real feeling of like you don't understand something until you can communicate to yeah. It to others. And oh, that was man, just amazing. I totally am of that philosophy. That's yeah. 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 So they, um, th that's what they say. So, but that's really, that's really interesting because uh, it, it always kind of seems like you can kind of fake your way through doing that with like literature and things. Cause there's almost like no answer. Uh, so you just practice, you can practice, practice, practice. That's how it was in college, but, but with mathematics or physics or statistics, if you're trying to communicate either right or wrong, either yeah. you're either getting it, you know, it's, it's such a hard art to figure out how to explain something that is tech so that that almost seems you know only designed to be communicated in a different language mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. and so you were so math so at smith they were very much like trying saying you got to do that yeah yeah so oh. it was really good it gave me really great training and sort of a foundation for how to communicate yeah. math and, and then eventually statistics um oh so, um, so I will, so moving away from college, so the way I found statistics finally was I, I was mostly, or not mostly, but I had a lot of friends who were like English majors and history majors. And one of them came home from the, I was like end of college. And I was like, I knew that I didn't want to go straight to graduate school. Cause I didn't know exactly, again, I was still trying to sort of find my path. Like I knew where I wanted to get eventually. And I didn't know how to get there. So I was applying for jobs and um, one of my friends came home from the career office back in the day when there were like binders that people would flip through. And she was like, Liz, I found the perfect job for you. It's called mathematics. <laughs> and it turns out it was actually called Mathematica, but um, <laughs> right. she, it, she was right. It was perfect. So it was um, oh, mathematical policy the, research. Got it. Okay. Um, where, you know, I, so I looked at it, I was like, oh, this does sound really interesting. And so Mathematica is a place that does like large scale, often government funded evaluations of various public policy initiatives. And so it was a way for me to be like, oh, I know math, I know computer science and coding. They hire research assistants slash programmers out of college to work on these policy evaluations. And it was really the first time that I was like, oh, here is a way that I can do the math and sort of, again, programming and that kind of side of things, um, but applied to these really interesting sort of policy areas. Um, okay. So that was That's, amazing. Yeah, I would love to talk about this for a second. So you like, so, so Mathematica, for those that don't know a lot about it, or maybe just know of it sort of like, it's kind of like, you know, it's like, it's like, it's like Rand or, you know, what, yeah. how would you, how would you just sort of walk us through uh, who Mathematica is and how you met them and what those first days were like. Yeah. So um, I applied for this, like they have different levels of positions, clearly like some undergrad masters, PhD. So I applied for one of the research assistant undergrad positions and, you know, the company as a whole, it has grown tremendously and changed quite a bit since 97 when I was there. Um, but it's really the thing that really, um, I just was such a good fit for me was the focus on sort of, making the world a better place through high quality research. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, mostly quantitative research, but some qualitative. And across a range of policy areas, I mostly, I actually worked at Mathematica, Mathematica again after graduate school. And um, both times I mostly was working on sort of education and labor, 
sort of non-health topics, but they do a lot of health work as well, a lot of Medicare, Medicaid. So it's a great environment for people who, again, sort of want to be doing research in a collaborative environment with other, sorry for the truck, really um, smart people who are really committed to making the world a better place. I, mm. I actually find much of the culture quite similar to Johns Hopkins in the School of mm. Public Health, mm -hmm. where it's a similar, that similar ethos of sort of high quality research, socially relevant, wanting to sort of contribute to these conversations. Um, was it causal inference? You say program evaluation, but I was wondering like, what did they, what, what were you exactly, was it what you would now consider causal inference? Type of yeah. Um, yeah. It was mostly randomized trials, especially mm -hmm. back in the late 90s. In fact, Mathematica and MDRC and some of these other firms sort of were really known for bringing more randomized trials to the world of policy mm -hmm. evaluation. Mm -hmm. So um, they yeah, we were I actually I remember better my later time there. But yeah, um, up like the upward bound randomized trials of the upward bound program to increase college going or of um, Head Start. I wasn't involved in the Head Start evaluation, but um, some labor job training programs. Now they do, I still consult for them and serve on a number of like technical advisory groups for them. So I'm still kind of no, and I, and I will say over time, they do more. And even after graduate school, they hired me again. Um, and we were doing more non-experimental studies. So some propensity score type things, some yeah. interrupted time series. So yeah, very much. I mean, it's a bit of a tension of kind of where, uh, like it's a little hard sometimes to be super innovative in that world because, you know, the main products are these government reports going to Congress. Yeah. Um, and there's, a there's you know, concern, like you don't want to necessarily use like the like latest and greatest that hasn't been sort of vetted. Yeah. Um, so, you know, sort of foundational methods, though. Um, so that's really where I discovered causal inference. And just to jump ahead a little. Um, were you doing, but, were they doing quasi-experimental matching type stuff at, at Mathematica? In like the late, when I was first there, like the late 90s, um, probably. I, I wasn't involved myself, but I, the way I found the Harvard Statistics Department and working with Don Rubin is I was talking to the people at Mathematica and I sort of had learned like, this is the kind of stuff I want to do. So I would mm. say like, Hey, I want to go to graduate school. Like, are there any statisticians that you sort of work with or like who um, in the statistical community is doing the kind of stuff that is relevant for this world? And Don's name was the main name they would mention. When, when you say relevant for this world, what, what were you already starting to say? I, I want my career to be this. What, what were you, what were you beginning to articulate? I would say that I was kind of crystallizing this vision of being able to do, um, again, sort of something like mathy. It turns out statisticsy uh, that related to social good. And again, mm. I'm sort of saying the same thing, but just kind of it was again just getting a little crisper of how I, how exactly I could do that. Yeah. Um, and, and you saw that tradition of math, social good at like your colleagues at Mathematica as well as the mission at Mathematica. Is that right? Am I putting exactly. more? Okay. Exactly. Okay. Um, and now I've sort of found public health back then. I didn't even really know about public health, mm. um, but yeah, it was just sort of that, like, Oh, here's a bunch of people who are really smart quantitatively who know sort of rigorous methods mm -hmm. and who want to be applying those methods to important questions around how do we set up the food stamp system or how do we best mm -hmm. serve kids who are four years old entering school. Yeah. Um, how do we best, what are good reading programs for elementary schoolers? Like those yeah, yeah, were yeah. the substantive questions that really motivated me. And this was a way for me to use my quantitative skills um, to mm. help me answer those. Were they pretty responsive? Your colleagues at, uh, they were like, yes, Harvard, Don Rubin. Is that what they were kind of saying? Sort of. So the other background here, and um, I might, I might be about to offend like 80% of your listeners. Um, <laughs> So almost everyone at Mathematica, especially back then, were economists. Uh, and I actually was living in Princeton, New Jersey at the time and <laughs> was hanging out with like a bunch of the Princeton econ grad students because, mm. you know, they were the cool kids in town. Um, and I ended up marrying one of them. So I'm married to a macroeconomist. Um, but I like from talking to all of them, I sort of knew that economic like in some ways, econ would have been the natural path 
for me, like kind of, I was surrounded by economists mm -hmm. and they were clearly doing the kind of work that I, especially liked. Princeton, especially cause that's the angrist orly, yeah. uh, all that stuff. But you, yep. so that's, that's fascinating. Okay. Keep going. But I, I kind of just, I don't know, something, I just felt like econ wasn't the right fit for me. Um, partly I think I wanted just like slightly more fully towards math. Like I, I kind of right. did, I got the, I could sort of tell, I didn't really want to take like economic theory classes yeah. and sort of that right. I wanted more just like methods. Right, um, right. and also again, this I, apologies if I'm offending 80% of the listeners, um, my friends in econ grad school didn't seem super happy oh, yeah. <laughs> or at least some of them. And it just felt like a pretty competitive field. Like yeah, sort yeah, of you just validated 90% of my listeners right there. Um, that, like that grad statistics, part. <laughs> you know, I think especially like statistics felt like welcoming uh, right. in a way that econ honestly didn't, um, yeah. at least for me. And so, yeah. uh, so I applied to, I also, I did look at like some like applied math programs or mm -hmm. actually I even looked at some demography programs mm. that were more quantitative in the end. I mostly was focused on either statistics or a couple biostatistics programs, but mostly like Carnegie Mellon, for example, has this amazing, um, joint program between statistics and public policy. So it mm. would have been sort of a joint degree. Um, University of Washington has a really great center for statistics and the social sciences. They were both very tempting. Um, in the end, I kind of wanted to go back to New England. My grandparents were outside Boston. It just sort of, uh, and I knew, again, I knew Don especially was doing sort of exactly the kind of policy relevant work that I wanted to do. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Right. So so you apply to Harvard. What'd you do? Did you contact Don or what's the, what was the con what, what's the process back then of like, I mean, cause you're just like a high ability, uh, high ability student. That's going to look fantastic on paper, but you know, what, what, what exactly was your overall strategy about, you know, applying to graduate school and, and then, you know, going about it. What, what do you remember very well how you went about that? So I remember I applied to about 10 places and I talked to a ton of people like um, at those places and other places. So this is one piece of advice for anyone is like, take advantage of your of networks and sort of just reach out. And like I, I had some really helpful conversations with like what I vividly remember one conversation with this woman, Montserrat Fuentes, who. I never ended up really working with, but she was incredibly generous with her time, especially actually like, I think she might've been sort of a senior graduate student at the time. Mm. So I just like used, you know, networks and sort of re talk to a ton of people. It's funny you ask about Dawn. I have no memory of whether I like reached out before applying or mm. if I um, just waited and see if, if I got in um, my yeah. essay, you know, for grad school, you need sort of an essay and my, um, essay looking back is actually a topic I'm still very interested in and haven't done anything on, but my essay was sort of around like modeling, uh, like that I wanted to sort of model like food stamp programs. And like, it had a very, if the Harvard stat department looked at it, I'm sure it was very clear that Don would be a good fit for me. Yeah. Um, I also did apply to the NSF graduate research fellowship, um, and got one of those, although I had gotten into the I had gotten into Harvard before. You know, I don't think a lot that. of students know that that fellowship has played a role in a lot of people's careers. Yeah. It, it really, I was wondering if you could just, like, it's probably worth just stopping and just saying what, what it is you just said. What is, what is, can you say a little bit about that? I can try. It's been years. Um, although I did just talk to a, an undergrad who uh, is applying. So it was, it was bringing back, um, she was looking for advice. So to this point, I now sort of pay it back. And all these people who helped me with these random conversations 25 years ago, um, I now, you know, often talk to sort of random people, which is great. So the NSF runs this graduate research fellowship and you apply, you know, I think that the timing is sort of similar to the PhD application yeah. deadlines but it's totally separate from them. So like you're applying to PhD programs and then you separately apply to the NSF program and it basically provides funding. Um, and in many cases, like for statistics, I was gonna be getting funding, like most statistics programs provide full funding anyway. Um, but the NSF, A, I think sometimes departments might let someone in if, 
if they know they're coming with an NSF fellowship because they're free. I don't think it covers all five years. Um, that would be a good thing to check. But um, but still, it sort of is like departments might be more likely to admit someone with it. Because they're and not it also have just, to pay for them. Yeah, they don't have to pay for them. Um, the it main, also frees people like, up. Is it is it mainly that, oh, Elizabeth's free. She's it's, not gonna she's not well, gonna crowd out a student. Is it not just that? I think it's partly that and partly the signaling of like here's someone who put together this great application and has, who has some been ideas. screened by this other reputable group that we even that that's that's great. Um, you know, and then the other thing it can students. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Just the final thing it can do is in some places, like if you were getting funding from the university, it might be a lot of TA roles. Mm, whereas right. if you come in with the NSF, you might sort of not have to do as much of that. So you have a little bit more freedom. Um, so you got one of those mm -hmm. and you applied to a bunch of these places and you got, you know, you got a lot of love back from them. And then you were like, I mean, I'm sure it wasn't like a hard, you weren't like pulling your hair out. Should I go to Harvard? But like, uh, you, you chose Harvard. So you, you get there and, uh, um, what was it like stepping foot in that distinguished, you know, uh, department with, with Don Rubin, was he the chair of the department at the time? No, oh, maybe part of the time. Um, I actually forget. I think it might've been someone else in the beginning and then he might've taken over. Um, you know, it was great. We, I, well, so two things, two main things I would say, well, first, well, a couple of things. So first, um, to be clear, one challenge was there were no female faculty in the department. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so I wasn't, I had come from Smith, <laughs> all women's oh, yeah. college. And, um, but granted, even at Smith, I had many, like most of my professors who I worked closely with were men. And then at Mathematica, my main mentors were men. Like it wasn't like I had only, in fact, I'd had very few female mentors. So, um, but still the culture, uh, there was that piece, but my class was amazing. So one advice is just like, use your cohort. Um, we had eight of us in my cohort and I think six of us ended up finishing the program. And a few of us in particular, we're just like, they got me through. Like I entered a statistics PhD program, not knowing what maximum likelihood estimation was. Um, like I had run regressions and I had, I knew math, but I didn't know the basics of statistics. Yeah. And it was my classmates who helped you with that. Helped me. We had study sessions. We got through it sort of together. Um, and right. that was really important. Yeah. The other really great thing for me at Harvard was um, the broader environment. So, uh, now it's called, I guess, Institute for Quantitative Social Science that Gary King runs, um, had a really great environment of bringing people together from across campus. Mm. I took a couple of classes in economics. I worked also with um, Alan Zaslavsky, who is at the in healthcare policy over at the medical school. Mm -hmm. So there were all of these different people who were doing this sort of bridging that I really liked, this sort of mm. like quantitative methods, but in various applied areas. So you're an applied, you are, you're an applied person. You're, yeah. you're, you're not just wanting to stay inside those stats classes. If it's not going to be relevant, totally to, like, <laughs> re relevant to your larger, it's like, it's, it's in service of this larger thing yeah. of this, of this social goal. Is that right? So like, totally. Yeah. The, the math is in service of the larger normative questions about the welfare of people. Yes. Thank you for okay. <laughs> articulating that better yeah. than I can. Well, you know, it's so funny. I'm teaching this history of economic thought class right now. And it's like, I am reading Adam Smith and I was like, oh, Adam Smith was just like, he just loved to think about all this stuff. And then I find, and then I get to it. I was like, Adam Smith actually just cared about the overall welfare of human beings. And, oh, cool. and that's why he spent all this time thinking about stuff that now he's remembered for. But you, he actually was really deeply, con he was very concerned about public policy, which is what oh, it sounds cool. like you, you are too. Yep. Yeah. That's really cool. That's really cool. That goes back, I guess, you know, it's like it, you think back to the, the missional kind of spirit of your family. I mean, I'm just now kind of, I'm sort of riffing a little bit, but like, you know, you telling me that you grew up this, with this, this uh, pastor father who sorts, uh, who gets hurt and then sorts into more pastoral care you know it's just always been in your that's been the a part of your core values is that right totally yeah yeah wow what a fortunate set of events 
you know, Elizabeth, it, this is something I was just kind of thinking about. It's like, um, and I, and I don't really have a lot of people to ever talk about this with, but like, I'm going to, I'm going to take advantage of this right now. It's like, it's, you know, it's funny, like with causal inference, I think there's like two paradigms out there. There's a group of people that find everything that you and I kind of are, are, are interested in and that you actually are contributor to, um, uh, really the, the avenue in to it is the experimental design. Like it's like experiments. That's the framework. They don't know about potential outcomes, right? Nobody in medicine, a lot of people in medicine have never heard of potential outcomes. They don't know anything like that, but like, you know, it, it, and even down deep into the, you know, even down deep into college education and then even back into high school, the idea of the randomized control trial, you know, is how they think about causal inference. And they don't really go any deeper than that per se, like, you know, to this, like, potential outcomes framework but like it's funny because because of my background in economics i did not get any experimental design at all a lot, a lot of people do you know like my we have a colleague i have a colleague rebecca thornton she's a michael kramer student at a development economist she's from harvard she's a contemporary viewer she would have been there at the same time you know she thinks about experiments you know because that's that group right but like and then I've got another colleague, he's a lab experimentalist, but I don't because like in economics, if you don't do experiments, you were doing the quasi experiments. And, and that's where there was this huge lift with this potential outcome stuff. But, you know, because I got into it that way, um, causality has always felt like metaphysical almost multiple worlds, you know? Uh, and I just was kind of curious, like what has been for you this, like th this kind of like, what, what's been, it ha has this idea of the potential outcomes framework. Is that like for you, you know, you came from Mathematica, they were doing all these experiments. Right. And then you like, and then you learn potential outcomes and it's just like, is it just a tool for you or does, does it also seem like really a, unusual? I mean, I know it's like a hundred years old in stats, so I don't even know what you guys think about it, but I still cannot to this day get over how absolutely science fiction the whole thing is. <laughs> yeah, it's a good point. I mean, and the way I, I, I think the way I think about it is that, and you know, this is like some of Don Rubin's writings from like the seventies is you, you need the potential outcomes to define the estimate. Like, I think one of the things that causal inference is really good at and that uh, I continually try to teach is first, what is your estimate? Like, what are we trying to estimate? What is the causal effect of interest? How do we define that? And then second step is to have a study design that try to get, tries to get you towards that estimate. Mm -hmm. And you know, and like Don always taught me that sort of like the, uh, that kind of this, like the, again, just that, that like the estimate is separate from how you learn about the estimate mm -hmm. and study design is how you learn about it, but that we define the estimate sort of without reference to the particular design. Yeah. For me then sort of my time at Mathematica was incredibly useful because I, like in graduate school, I did mostly work on non-experimental designs and propensity scores. Yeah. At Mathematica, I had worked mostly on uh, randomized experiments. Right, and right. so this isn't like philosophical, but on a practical way, this really got me thinking a lot about the trade-offs of different study designs. And sort mm. of, I saw the complexities of carrying out these large trials in practice. And like, they right. are, they are expensive. They are hard. You run into problems. And it really got me thinking about like, well, for a given estimate, you know, is a trial always better and right. maybe not. And that's where I then sort of started doing work in generalizability of trial results. And, mm. but again, sort of always really focused on like, what is the estimate first? And then let's talk about designs and analyses uh, yeah. to get to that. Um, yeah. And that to me has helped kind of distinguish. Um, and it, it sort of, it always drives me crazy when people sort of jump straight to the design or sort yeah. of straight to the analysis, even worse, totally. uh, yeah. without like, well, what are we trying to do here? What are, what is, yeah, right. What is it? You know, you can say the, it's funny, you could say the, the estimate and you can write that down, but saying this is my estimate is really close to saying, what is my question? 
Yeah. Right? Like, well, why, why, what is it I really want to know? And then when you really start kind of laying that down, saying what I really want to know is, um, th that leads directly into that, that S demand. I, I, I guess I was like, you know, kind of just thinking lately, I was just, you know, th and this does get into your, your work because you're working on matching, well, let me just ask you this. So, so you work with Don on matching and you write this dissertation on, uh, on, on multiple control groups. And I do want to talk about that because there's this other new paper that you have that I wanted to just kind of ask about, but what, what, what was it, what was the, like the, 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 what was exciting about what, what was exciting about that? You could have done lots of social impact types of work. Why were you gravitated towards the matching stuff? You know, this is like the vagaries of, you know, partly, honestly, I remember being in Don's office like my first year and he's like, he sort of knew my general interests uh, and he's like, you know, no one's really working on matching right now. Like there's mm. this whole field and like no one's really doing anything on it. Um, and so it was partly like just looking for opportunities um, where there was like an open area with open questions. Uh, and then. I, yeah, and so sort of the multiple com control groups part came in, it was actually motivated, as you said earlier, like I am usually very motivated by specific applied problems. And it was motivated by a, a study of a high school program where there were like some schools getting this program in particular cities. And like you could potentially get some matches from those same cities or mm -hmm. from other cities. Uh -huh. And but like there's a tension there, right? Because the same city uh, might be those schools are then going to be exactly the same in terms of the local economic environment, et cetera. But there might be more selection bias of which schools got it within yeah. that city. And so then right. the other cities might be better in terms of confounding in other dimensions, mm -hmm. but would be like a different economic context. And so. Yeah. My dissertation sort of probed like those kind of like that trade off of sort of, well, when do we want to prioritize the local matching versus this sort of far matching in a sense? Oh, interesting. Still basing it on covariates, but it was like certain types of covariates that you might have an opinion about beforehand or something or what's yeah. the deal? And, and that you might, so we have some observed covariates, but then we also are going to be worried about some unobserved covariates. But mm. we can uh, adjust for some of those unobserved ones by doing this local match, because like the local economic conditions, if we get them from the same area, we know that we've matched on that. Oh, that's cool. You know, uh, versus actually... if we go to a different, yeah. if we compare Boston to Texas, um, we know that Boston is different from Texas, but maybe the schools are very similar, like yeah, this on the point. on the observed characters. So it's sort of a balancing observed and right. unobserved confounding. This is a point that Heckman and and Jeff Smith and Petra Todd end up sort of saying. Uh, at least I know at least Petra and Jeff do, and I I think there's actually a uh, a paper with Heckman about sort of the responses to Rahib Dajia's and and Waba's sort of work on propensity scores, which is that there, there's just this, you know, the importance of matching on context. Yeah. Like of yeah. pulling from the same labor market. So this was like a formalization of, of that sort of idea mm. and sort of, and then like we had a sensitivity parameter to sort of say, and I, I want to like, I give it, we don't have infinite time. So I want to just say one thing that I, in the past year, I've sort of realized one of the things I love about causal inference is that you have to bring in substantive expertise. Like yeah. I cannot, well, in non-experimental contexts, especially. Right. As a statistician with a data set in front of me, I will have no idea what non-experimental designs are appropriate because it's about things we can't observe. Yep. And so you have to engage with subject matter experts who can help you think through, okay, well, how much does local context matter for this question, this outcome, right. et cetera? Right, because um, it may matter and it may not matter. Right. Exactly. I mean, it's like, so it's like you, you, it's not like this is in a textbook that says, and you always do X, Y, Z. Yeah. Because, there's no recipe. <laughs> because, but so what is the thing you you've got to, so, so what, what do you think the expert knowledge actually is? It's not because it doesn't seem like the expert knowledge necessarily is I'm an expert on education. It's more like I'm an expert on this program in this area. Is that right? It's like an expert on treatment assignment or, or what is it? I think, yeah, an expert who understands a, yeah, how like, so one piece might be the, how 
treatments were uh, determined and sort of, okay, which schools did get this and what was the decision-making process involved in that? And that might involve some qualitative conversations. Right. Um, And then the second piece is the sort of the outcome piece of like, okay, if we're interested in economic outcomes, what are the baseline characteristics that are going to be really important to be able to adjust for in sort of a, in studying those longer term outcomes and how much of it is about an individual versus their context and sort of just that sort of substantive con- knowledge about these processes and the outcomes and kind of what leads to different outcomes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. That's great. So, so you, you, you know, so it's, it's really interesting, this conversation, because I had it in my mind, you know, since I'm not an econometrician, I don't really know what goes on in their heads, you know, like, or same thing with you. It's like, I don't know. They, they just love matching. That's what they do. They wake up in the morning, they want to match and then they go to bed at night and they want to match. <laughs> but it's like, you're, you're different. You're saying it was always a means to a larger end. This, or this, this has been, obviously it's independent. I mean, I'm guessing it's also just, you know, genuinely beautiful and interesting to you the way math is and all of this, but it's always been, I want to, it's, is it, is it, is it, you're saying, I want to, I want to do the matching. I want to do this work on covariates and things like this, but I, I, I want to get back to what I was doing at Mathematica. Yeah. That like, I, um, I, uh, I have very low tolerance for methods just for the sake of methods, um, that sort of, I want there to be a grounding in some applied problem where we're trying to solve some problem that people encounter when they have real data in front of them. Sort of someone is doing an evaluation or they wanna study some causal effect and they are like, oh, well, propensity score methods exist, but I have complex survey data and how do I use those with complex survey data? Or, Mm -hmm. oh, I have missing covariates. How do I combine these methods given the realities of the messiness that individual studies have? That is really what has sort of motivated much of my work is that, so again, I think of like, I don't, I don't really develop new methods or like sort of theories of methods. It's more, how do we help people use methods or how do we adapt or expand methods uh, to deal with real data complications? Well, so in your career, if you could just sort of say like a, a study that you did that you just think back and, you know, on, when you're old, you know, you're going to look back and you're going to be like, you're going to, you're going to remember that study and it's going to make you feel positive feelings, right? Like it could be happiness or gratitude or something that you've been involved in that you just think I, I, that, that was worth it. What would that be? Uh, Oh, wow. I love that question. Um, I would say there are two, but one of them isn't actually really, we didn't do a super careful causal job. Um, Oh, that is such a good question. I would say one might be um, a study I worked on just applying standard propensity score methods to studying suicide prevention in Denmark. And it was using Mm. Danish registry data. So national data, it's really hard to study suicide because of large, like you need a large sample size, you need a long follow-up. And so just sort of putting out a paper actually, or a similar one is Annals of Internal Medicine recently on a policy evaluation of opioid policy, where Mm. we aren't, necessarily like using new fancy methods. It's more using good, solid existing methods to answer really important questions and helping illustrate how to do that. Yeah. Um, So the third one though, I will say is um, with, this is again, more on the personal side during the pandemic, I worked on um, using some of the meta Facebook COVID trends and impact survey data on schooling. And so I was a, you know, I had kids in school who were not in school because they were home And um, I just knew there was a dearth of data and evidence on uh, the risks of in-person schooling. Um, And like there was lots of debate and very little empirical data. And so I was able to work with some epidemiologists and using this large scale Facebook survey to look at the links between in-person schooling and COVID outcomes within households. Yeah. Published it in science, which was amazing. And just sort of like, it was one of those papers where I was like, this was a huge topic of a lot of debate and very little data and evidence. Mm. And we were able to provide that data and do, I think, a solid analysis um, to really help sort of, I mean, who knows, <laughs> but yeah. at least provide some information. Um, and so I think that one too, just given the timeliness and yeah. um, 
potential impact. Yeah. Yeah. That's something, I mean, how would you describe to, to Elizabeth Stewart, uh, back in high school, uh, doing field hockey and math camp or math club, uh, you know, this is a feeling that you get in the, the math social science. What would, what would you say? How would you explain to her? It's doing these kinds of things feels like this. What, what would she understand as you tell her? Oh gosh. Um, yeah, just sort of the, the feeling of being able to contribute to conversations that matter for people's lives by providing like good, solid, objective analysis. Um, mm. And that sort of that is incredibly meaningful to be able to use sort of the skills that I have and the training and the mentoring and, you know, all of the sort of learnings I've gotten and again, huge mentoring um, to then be able to contribute in these ways. It's incredibly gratifying um, yeah. and to yeah. work with great people. I value incredibly strongly working with people who are kind and collaborative and yeah. generous. And I've been incredibly lucky throughout my career to, to do that. And I, that's just really important to me. I think looking back, if it had been like, Oh, you could do all this great science, but you wouldn't be having fun. And it would be with people who are not good people or not to not, you know, who won't treat you well, like that, I wouldn't have wanted that path. Right, so I think right. the fact that I can do both um, is just really wonderful. Mm. I want to, it's top of the hour and I, I want us to, I, I, I want to respect your time. I just want to end with one thing. So, you know, now the world is so different uh, than when you were in high school or even in college uh, where, uh, you know, the, 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 you think back to when you were in New Jersey and, and it was like, well, the only natural thing for me to do would if I'm interested in math, social science is economics. And you, you, you sort of were like, you, you just kind of knew uh, that. I mean, it's kind of interesting that like that, that one did not make the cut. And that one sort of is like the poster child for math help, you know, math, public policy. But yeah. like now it just seems like there's lots more, uh, options, but I don't know if that's salient to people at the beginning of search. And I just was kind of curious if you could just sort of describe, you know, what exactly do you see the train being and the different kind of tentacles into these meaningful math, social impact careers? Yeah, I think about this a lot because I think it's like there, a lot of these opportunities exist, but they are not easy to find necessarily. So um, there are, you know, some statistics programs, with, as I mentioned a couple earlier, um, with great emphasis in this area, but it's not like someone can do a Google search for like social statistics, PhD programs. Mm -hmm. You can for biostatistics, like biostatistics exists. I now am faculty in a biostat department, but you know, that is more health oriented, although there's some blurring of that line. So I like, I still don't quite know the solution here, but I have put together a Google doc that just kind of tries to list these programs that are at this interface. Cause I think I found, I sort of stumbled my way and found this path, but it's not a path that is like obvious from again, from like a quick Google search. So I am on a little bit of a mission to try to help <laughs> people try to find their path. Again, this, this Google doc is one way. Um, and again, but there are lots of paths too. And I think that's the other key is in reality, uh, someone's career might look very, very similar if they get a, PhD in econ or a PhD in a quantitative like epidemiologic methods or a PhD in statistics with a focus yeah. on this. So there's, I think that's the other kind of big picture is like, there's a lot of different paths that often might end up in very similar places. Um, and so I just want to help people you know, see, see the whole variety of those paths and yeah. then hopefully find the one that seems but right it, to them. You know, it, do you think it's, do you think it's probably the truth? This is going to be like a, th this is going to be the thing that could be controversial at a, at a liberal arts college, probably if they were listening, but like, do, do you think that it's probably something that's not terribly controversial to say that if you are really interested in social impact work, right. And it, it, that, that maybe taking a second look at, taking a few more math courses in college is probably not, not crazy. I, totally. I think it's some math classes, some statistics classes, some whatever's there, classes. um, you know, having that data literacy, even if you are not going to be the one like right. running all the models or learning all the super fancy new methods, 
um, having that grounding, I think is really, really useful. Um, and especially sort of just for career purposes, uh, I think generally will come across well. Yeah. That's what I was thinking as you were talking, it was like, you know, how do you advise a student to sort into something that you don't know what they want to sort into and they may not know, but they have a vague idea that it's like social impact, social science, et cetera. It's kind of like, you know, I think there's a, there's, there's a lot of that probably, you know, calc one to three linear algebra, taking some statistics, you know, uh, get some computer science. It just is, it's just kind of like the reality of where we are in 2022 probably will be for a while that those are, those are probably not as optional of elective things as you might, as some people might hope. But the thing is like, they, they are really worth it. Right. I mean, like I, I come from a English major background and, but doing, doing empirical work to understand the world and try to provide help in a difficult policy question it, 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 it's, it's for many people, it's really meaningful. Yeah, totally. Um, and I think the other angle on that is I also like to advise students, like if you don't really know your path, try to pick a path that keeps other doors open, keep other doors and, open and keep doing quantitative stuff. Like I now can do education and I can do public health and I can do like, I was on a call yesterday about, about fisheries, like, mm. you know, sort of, um, having the really solid, math quant training um, keeps other doors open to then be able to sort of move across. Um, yeah. And so that was, that's also been one of the things I've loved about statistics is that ability to kind of, I, I'm, I'm totally indecisive. I like to <laughs> do lots of different things. And me so uh, this is a way for me to continue doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Elizabeth, it is such a pleasure to talk and um, uh, you know, th this, this interview could have gone about a million different ways. And I had, a bunch of stuff about matching in here, but I loved the way that we, we talked about the, these things. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for uh, sitting with me. And um, it's really an honor to get to talk to you and, and, and uh, hear about your life. Great. No, it's an honor to be on the podcast. I, I appreciate being included. So thanks so much. Okay. Bye-bye.